Did you eat porridge this morning? What if I told you that even porridge can kill you? A surveillance camera captured a horrible accident that happened to an Indian cook. On July 29, 2022, Mutu Kumar was cooking a big pot of porridge for a Diwali festival, the most important holiday of the Tamil Nadu state. They say that on that day, the cook was a bit tipsy. Unable to keep standing, he fell into a pot with hot cereal and boiled himself almost to death. Although Mukumar was taken out of the hot water, he still died of the burns, which covered 65% of his body. So it turns out that at any given time, you may get killed by the most innocent things. Are you a hot bath lover? And do you know how hot it has to be to boil you to death? Although the water temperature of 43 degrees Celsius is relatively safe, its influence can be deadly, as the human pain threshold is at around 42 degrees Celsius. It's also noteworthy that children and the elderly have thinner skin and get more serious trauma from short-term exposure to hot water. A third-degree burn may result after 10 minutes in 49-degree water and after just one second in the water with a temperature of 71 degrees. But don't be quick to think that your bathroom is the only place where such a situation can occur. On October 11th, 2012, 62-year-old Jose Molina was doing his usual job at a California plant named Bumblebee Foods, which produced canned fish and seafood. Jose's job was technical maintenance of an 11-meter long stove, which was inside of a cylindrical furnace. It's used to sterilize tuna cans. At some point, the man's co-workers realized they hadn't seen him in a few hours. They started looking for Jose, but it was like he disappeared. Two hours before that, Jose climbed into the furnace to inspect the stove, but the other workers didn't see the man was inside. So they loaded it with over 5,500 kilograms of canned tuna and inadvertently trapped their colleague in the rear end of the furnace. When Jose found himself in this trap, the stove got turned on and heated to a temperature of over 130 degrees Celsius. He died in the first seconds but his body sat in the boiling mass for around two hours. The plant's executive director, Angel Rodriguez, and his former safety manager, Sol Flores, were charged with three instances of violating the rules imposed by the Occupational Safety and Health Division. Deputy County Prosecutor, who led the case, said that despite having occupied his chair for over 20 years and worked with around 40 manslaughter cases, Jose's accident featured the worst death conditions he'd ever seen. Initially, the company's executive director and manager were sentenced to three years of imprisonment and a fine, but eventually the punishment was mitigated since the offenders reportedly pleaded guilty. Bumblebee Company paid one and a half million dollars to the Molina family. Yet this isn't the last time someone's neglect caused a horrible death. For example, this video shows the events that happened in 2019 in Penza, Russia. As you can see, a car with two passengers is trying to go around a hole in the road, resulting from a pipe breach. Nevertheless, the vehicle still falls into it. At first glance, what's the big deal? The hole isn't that large anyway, but the pipe was full of very hot water used for heating. So the car is now in boiling water and the two passengers are trapped. If the local authorities had paid attention to pipe maintenance and the municipal services employees had reacted faster, and restricted vehicle movement near dangerous areas, those two wouldn't have been boiled to death in their car. But there are cases when, apart from others' neglect, the victim is responsible for their own death. For example, in Yellowstone National Park, people die almost on a regular basis, but the flow of tourists never stops. Yellowstone's main feature is that here, you can see countless geothermal pools, hot springs, and geysers. Their temperatures can reach 250 degrees Celsius. Just standing nearby, you may get third degree burns. That's why you have to walk only on specially built wooden paths, not veering off by a single step. But sometimes, even this is not enough. In 2006, a six-year-old boy from the state of Utah received severe burns after slipping on a wet plank decking near Old Faithful Geyser. He fell into the hot water and miraculously survived this horrific accident did not become a warning for 23-year-old Colin Nathaniel Scott from Portland, Oregon. In 2016, he visited the park with his sister. Together, they stepped off the wooden decking and walked for over 180 meters in the Norris Geyser Basin 
and when the hot water suddenly erupted, it covered Colin entirely. Luckily for her, the sister was a bit further away, and she immediately ran to get help. But she was the only survivor. The rangers didn't even manage to find her brother's body. And again, in six years, the same accident repeated. But strangely, this time, the victim was not some adrenaline-seeking youngster, but 70-year-old Il Hoon Ro. He veered off the path and slipped to the Abyss Pool located in Yellowstone Lake's West Thumb Geyser Basin. It happened on July 31st, and only on August 16th, in the hot spring with a temperature of 78 degrees and a depth of 16 meters, the rescuers found a shoe and part of a foot. DNA tests have proved these human remains belong to Il. But all these victims were more or less aware of the risk they were taking and how it could end for them, as do the people who work potentially life-threatening jobs, although the cause of their death is not thrill-seeking, but regular work responsibilities. On February 25th, 2022, the employee divers of the LMCS Maintenance Company were working at the Pariah Fuel Trading Company LTD oil plant, located in the town of Pointe-à-Pierre. The team consisted of Kazim Ali Jr., whose father served as the executive director, group leader Fiesel Kurban, Yusuf Henry, Rishi Nagasar, and Christopher Boudram. Their task was to install a standpipe, but for that, they had to work inside a pipe with a diameter of 90 centimeters, which lay under the water approximately 400 meters from the shore. In the Gulf of Pariah, the scuba divers plunged to the depth of 18 meters and started maintenance work when the safety valve that allowed them to safely stay inside the pipe suddenly flung open. This provoked a powerful vacuum effect that sucked all five men deep into the piping. At that moment, Kerbin's son, Michael, was working nearby in his boat. He heard the emergency call via radio and rushed to the site, but Michael saw no one leading the search at the spot, so he took this initiative upon himself, calling his brother, uncle, and friend, who were also divers, to his aid. When he dove, he found one of the workers, Boudram, at the depth of approximately 15 meters inside an oil-covered pipe. He grabbed the man and got him to the surface. Michael went back to search for his father, but he found only diving gear. The diver could not move forward, as the length of his safety rope limited him. His team heard strange noises in the piping and were ready to continue searching, but were not allowed to do so because that was a safety rules violation. Christopher Boudram sustained serious injuries, but felt better after treatment in a hospital hyperbaric chamber with a high oxygen concentration. The man said that the moment he got sucked into the pipe, he saw the other divers in the air pocket. One of them was wounded and unable to move. The Pariah Company claimed they were conducting surveillance over the divers from the shore while they were working, and that when the accident happened, the company representatives immediately contacted the Coast Guard and rescue divers were at the ready. Yet the victims' families stated the company allowed to send remote cameras into the pipe only 12 hours after the first accident. Moreover, the rescue divers did not want to enter the pipe until its contents were pumped out. For another two days, there was a certain hope the missing divers could have survived precisely due to the air pockets, even though the air quality in them was most likely bad. But no one descended into the pipe to save the remaining divers. Today, they are presumed to be dead. As you can see, in such situations, no one might even come to your rescue. Still, even when the rescue squads utilize all resources to save the victim, it just might not work. In 2009, a 26-year-old speleologist, John Johns, decided to explore the depths of the Nutty Putty Hydrothermal Cave located in Utah, United States. It's known for its narrow and slippery tunnels, turns, and curves. Its length amounts to 413 meters, and its depth is 44 meters. John and his brother, Josh, had loved speleology since they'd been kids. And many years later, they decided to go back to this hobby by going to Nutty Putty alongside nine of their friends. In the first hour, the expedition went well. The group was exploring the cave's largest room called the Big Slide. Then, John decided to pass through the notoriously challenging narrow passage, the so-called Birth Canal, which opened into a bigger room. But as far as he entered the tunnel, the speleologists could not see its end. At some point, John made a wrong step and fell into an almost vertical fissure. It was impossible to get out of it by himself. The crack was only 25 by 46 centimeters wide. 
John ended up trapped facing downward at a depth of over 30 meters below the ground. Josh tried to get his brother out, but in vain. Then he ran to get help. First, the rescuers rubbed grease into the cave walls to help John slip through the crack, but it didn't help. Then they used a rescue rope by tying one end around John's legs and pulling at the other. At the same time, they were drilling at chunks of rock near the victim, but the rock was too strong. In an hour, they managed to drill only a few centimeters. Meanwhile, John's condition was deteriorating. The thing is, it's much harder for the heart to function when a person is in an upside down position. The blood was continuously flowing to John's brain. The man himself was panicking and rocking from side to side, which only made matters worse. The rescuers tried once again to get the victim out with a rope. And when he was almost saved, the stone arch by John's feet, to which the rope was tied, crumbled. After this, John slipped into the crack again, now seemingly even deeper than before. Rocks started falling on the rescuers, and one of them even got knocked unconscious. Still, that didn't stop them. And when they managed to get John out, they noticed that his breath was almost imperceptible he didn't survive this trial and died. Overall, 137 rescuers worked persistently for 27 hours to save John, and some of them said it was the most challenging case in all their years of work. In addition, the authorities decided that getting his body out of the cave was too tricky, so it'll forever remain John Edwards John's final place of rest. Just a week after the tragedy, it was decided to close this part of the cave to visitors forever. but. If John got trapped because he was tempted by his own curiosity, certain victims owed their deaths to being possessed by the ambition of outdoing their idol. In 1990, on the eve of Halloween and the death of renowned magician Harry Houdini, his follower, Joseph Boris, decided to put on a real show. He planned a trick that involved him getting buried alive. Everyone realized it was impossible to pull off this stunt unharmed but no one managed to talk Joseph out of it. To create a sensation, Boris put on a white tuxedo and white lacquered shoes, meditated, and arrived in a white limousine at Blackbeard's Family Entertainment Center. The show began. The magician was handcuffed and locked in a plastic casket, then put in a grave at a depth of two meters. Then it was covered with seven tons of dirt and wet concrete. But this danger only increased the audience's excitement the harder the trick, the better for the magician's fame. So at that moment, Joe felt on top of the world and didn't worry, especially since Houdini pulled this trick off brilliantly. Joe himself also did the same trick successfully the year before, although without the concrete. He decided to add it in the hope of surpassing Houdini. He forgot to consider the fact that wet concrete weighs more than mud. And in this case, we're talking about almost 3,000 kilograms of the mixture. The magician had to unchain himself in one minute, get out of the casket, dig through the mud and the concrete, and shock the audience by jerking his hand out of the ground theatrically. He needed to do all of this fairly quickly, and he also had to hold his breath to get through the concrete mix that had been poured into the grave. Yet, something went wrong. It had already been five minutes, and the magician was nowhere to be seen. As it turned out, the weight of the concrete pushed the casket 60 centimeters into the ground. Burroughs' assistant and the park's employees rushed to the magician's rescue. They got him out of the hole, after which paramedics tried to resuscitate Joseph, but he was already dead. The experts supposed the cause of death was asphyxiation. This means that Burroughs died because the mud and the concrete got into his airways, or because the weight on his chest was so great that he couldn't breathe. After the accident, his assistants recalled him constantly fumbling up the calculations of how much concrete to pour into the grave. So, his lust for fame played a bad trick on him. He died in his own trap. Similarly, a trap got the best of 71-year-old barber, Bernard Gore. On January 6, 2017, he was supposed to meet with his wife, Angela, near Woolworth's shopping center in Sydney. But Mr. Gore never showed up. The woman raised the alarm a few hours after he didn't meet her in the center. The police searched the mall's public spaces and didn't find the man. It was like he'd disappeared off the face of the earth in the most mysterious manner. Nevertheless, on January 27th, an employee walked into the stairwell and saw the body of an old man, 
Judging by the body's position, it seemed that Bernard sat on a chair and then fell from it, facing forward. The thing is, Gore had dementia. Upon reviewing surveillance camera footage, Bernard was seen passing through the fire exit on the fourth floor and the door closing behind him. So, he just forgot how he got there, and it became an insurmountable task for the elderly man to go back since he found himself lost in a sprawling maze of stairs and corridors. It might seem like Bernard ended up in the back rooms, a mythical location from urban legends and horror games. It's a place with convoluted corridors that are impossible to escape from, so this creepy trip can go on forever. Apart from that, there are legends of terrifying creatures who live in the back rooms and hunt people. In reality though, there's nothing supernatural about Bernard's story. A retired man with dementia just ended up trapped in a closed space with no assistance or food. But some stories are scarier than bizarre recounts of death, and it's the spooky stories of what cadavers can get up to after the person passes. The only place scarier than a back room is the real hallway of an actual morgue, where the actual supernatural phenomena happened. For example, here, you may see a dead woman's body on a bed in a Chinese hospital, but suddenly, something half translucent flies out of it. People who believe in the afterlife are sure the cameras have captured the person's soul leaving the body. There's no scientific explanation for this incident, and this is an Indian hospital. Don't be alarmed, the people on the floor are alive, they're just sleeping. But look at the end of the hallway. At some point, a black silhouette appears and moves past quickly. Perhaps the mystical backroom entities really exist. But how do we know these videos aren't simply an editing trick? We must pay attention to the stories of morgue employees who say that mystical things do happen at their workplace. On one of the anonymous websites, an unknown girl shared the following story. One day, she was at work in the morgue when a hurricane started. She was all alone and couldn't leave the building as it was too dangerous. But the problem was that the morgue was in the basement near a hospital, which in turn was situated near a water body. Because of this, water started rising in the building and the girl didn't know if anyone would be able to reach her. She had to move all the bodies to the highest vaults so that they wouldn't get wet and thrown about the room. The girl prayed the generators wouldn't let the bodies thaw, even in this dangerous situation. She was thinking about her work. The flood was so extreme, the girl had to get up on her table and stand there for around two hours to avoid dying of hypothermia in the ice cold water. Suddenly, a knocking sound started coming from a vault where she put one of the bodies. It was pretty loud and insistent. The girl was scared, but there was nowhere to run. She was trapped with a corpse that had come to life. When the bad weather was over and the hospital employees came after the girl, she asked them to open the vault from which the sound was coming, since she was scared to do it herself. As it turned out, inside was a victim of drowning. Inside of his body, there was a crab. At some point, the crustacean got out of the corpse and started knocking his claw against the vault door. So, no mystery involved. But there was another story on that site, and it's no less spooky. One man wrote that he used to work in organ transplantation and his least favorite part was preparing the dead donor's bodies for the surgery. One time, he was holding a male cadaver's arm, meaning to shave it, but suddenly the dead man's fingers clasped his hand. The man recoiled and screamed. Of course, the corpse had just come alive and wanted to attack him, but in reality, he just got startled by an ordinary muscle contraction. This happens sometimes as well as countless other strange things that are in no way connected to anything supernatural. These are just some of our body's special features. The thing is, the decomposition of a corpse doesn't start until 48 to 60 hours after death. One of the scariest things a dead body can do during this time is to make moaning sounds, especially if the person was being resuscitated right before they died. Kayla Baki, a health and wellness expert, explains that when a doctor tries to resuscitate a person, extra air is pumped into the patient's lungs and stomach, and it can still leave the body after death, especially if the corpse is squeezed. For example, during transportation. That's why it gives off sounds that resemble moans. Bodily functions also don't stop immediately, so the cadaver may soil itself even after the heart stops beating. Ira Pasture, CEO of BioCork Incorporated, 
a biopharmaceutical company, assures that a lot of genes remain active in our body even a few hours after we die. Some of them were identified as embryonic development genes. It's like the genome is screaming, trying to tell the organism to go back to the past and start life all over again. And since the body's systems are kind of turning themselves off, the muscles can contract. That's why cadavers and morgues can move or even grab your hand. What cases of strange deaths do you know? Write about it in the comments and subscribe to my channel. After watching this video, you're unlikely to crawl into some geyser or a narrow cave passage. And I have many other stories that can save your life.